There we go. All right, Cheryl? Okay. So for those that weren't here last week, we started in John chapter 9, and we looked at that incredible miracle where Jesus opened the eyes of a man who was born blind. And uh, we saw that this was one of the signs, not just a miracle, but a sign. John chose seven miracles and he called them signs that revealed the glory of Jesus, revealed some aspect of our salvation. And of course, this is a wonderful picture of salvation because we were blind, weren't we? Spiritually blind. This man was blind from birth. We were born in sin. And uh, we were born, uh, you know, the, Paul says, the natural man doesn't understand the things of God. Doesn't, they don't they make any sense to him because he's spiritually blind. But when Jesus comes to us, he opens our eyes and all of a sudden we see God, we see the things of God and, and our whole life is born again in that sense. So that's what happened to that man. But what we found also is that uh, even though that man was blind physically, there were those that were blind spiritually. The leaders um, who did not want Jesus in their lives at all or in their religion at all. And so when, when they were confronted with this miracle, they did everything they could to try to explain it away or, or, or to, to uh, silence it and to close it down. They interrogated the man. They tried to get as much information from him as they could. Uh, and then they asked his parents, you know, is this really your son? Was he born blind? Uh, how, how, how then did he get his sight back? And they said, well, yeah, he, this is our son. And yes, he definitely was born blind. But how he's got his sight back, you better ask him. They, they, they were afraid that if they sided with Jesus, they'd be put out of the synagogue. And so this sort of thing went on. So what we find then is that they come back to this man and interrogate him again. So that's where we're, we're going to come in to the chapter uh, this week. So uh, just moving on. John chapter 9, we're at verse 24 now. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. So they could not deny that the man was born blind and that he now saw. They were confronted with this miracle. But they did all in their power to resist coming to the conclusion that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's why this man who was born blind can now see after all these years. We know that this man, they said, is a sinner. Not because he broke God's law regarding the Sabbath, but their man-made laws around the Sabbath. That's what, uh, you know, uh, he, was, he fell foul of because according to them, you can't do anything hardly on the Sabbath day, not even do good, not even bring healing and, and, and blessing to people. So they said, give glory to God. Now that's an interesting phrase. This man is a sinner, they said. What they meant by this was own up to the truth. Uh, You're in God's presence now, so give God the glory. Tell the truth here. Now, we, we, we learn that from going back into the Old Testament. There's a, an example of that here where uh, this man called Achan, when the children of Israel came into the promised land, they were told that they were not to take anything when they conquered the first city for themselves. But one man did, and they, they lost the next battle because of that. And then they found out that it was this man that had uh, contravened what they were told not to do. And so Joshua said to him, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. That's the meaning of that phrase. Tell the truth. Tell me now what you have done and do not hide it from me. So what they were saying to this man, this blind man is this. Come clean now. You know he's a sinner. You know he healed on the Sabbath day. Come over onto our side, side with us against him. At the moment, he was working against them because he had this incredible testimony 
that once he was blind and now he can see you. They're saying, come and join us and, 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 and support us in saying this man is a sinner. Give God the glory and, and come. We're on the right side. He's on the wrong side. That's what they were saying. This man replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. What I do know is that once I was blind, but now I see. That's the power of testimony, isn't it? The power of testimony. You know, many people can argue with us about many things and don't think you have to answer every question. Don't think if you don't have answers that somehow you're in the wrong. Nobody knows everything. And people will always come with trick questions to try to catch us out. But one thing that cannot be contravened is your testimony. You know what has happened to you. This man knew I was blind, but now I see. Nobody can take that from me and nobody can explain that away, you know, by, by um, you know, whatever argument. He's basically saying, look, whether he's a sinner or not, that's according to your interpretation of the law. He's contravened the law. I'm not going to get into that. That's what he was saying. I'm not going to go there with you. I'm going to go with what I do know, and that is that once I was blind, but now I see. And that's our testimony. You know, when we share with people, we don't have to think, oh, maybe they'll ask me a question that I can't answer, so therefore I'll keep silent. That doesn't matter. You're not there to answer every question that people come up with. But we are there to be witnesses or to give testimony of what Jesus has done in our lives. It's the power of our testimony that nobody can contravene. And we see this uh, often in the scripture. We are a people who know. We know what has happened to us. Here are some examples of that. Paul, in his last epistle, just before he was facing death, he said, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that that I have committed to him until that day. Well, isn't that tremendous? You know, he's about to, to be executed. And he said, I know this. I've committed my whole life to Jesus and it doesn't matter, you know, when, when they take my life, I know what's going to happen to me. Absent from the body, I'll be present with the Lord. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I know this. I know this. Nobody can take this away from me. Whatever they do to me, I know that uh, he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. And then Job. And incidentally, the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And you remember all that Job went through, a tremendous trial, everything that was thrown at him, all the sickness, the suffering in his family, the deaths and so on. And then those so-called friends of his come and condemn him, saying it's because of sin in your life. And he was, he was obviously uh, very gutted, very, very uh, confused about what was happening in his life. But he was able to say this incredible thing, after my skin is destroyed, in other words, after I'm, I die, I know, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. What an incredible declaration that is. You know, like way back then, he believed in the resurrection from the dead. And that's a fantastic thing, friends. He's saying, even though, I, you know, when I die, I know I'm going to be raised from the dead and in my flesh, I will see God. What a tremendous testimony. Here's another one. John said, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. God has changed our hearts. He's given us love. Man was talking about the love of God that comes to live inside us when we, we get saved. And, and we can love, you know, let's be honest, not, people are not always lovable. We're not always lovely <laughs> and lovable. Amen? But we know as Christians we're able to love one another, to walk with one another, to forgive and to encourage and to, to, to walk in the love of God. And that's how we know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. Paul said this in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. That's an, another affirmation that we can all make. Whatever's happening, we don't have to understand why these things happen. We don't have to uh, make rhyme or reason of it sometimes, but we just know this, that all things that take place in our life will work together for good. Not just the good things, all things, even the bad things 
the unpleasant things. They're working for us and they will work for our good ultimately. We can make that affirmation. And here's another one. John says, uh, Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Is that a beautiful acclamation or affirmation, isn't it? We know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. This body, this mortal, corruptible body will be changed, incorruptible, immortal, like unto his glorious body. That body that, that was able to uh, defy <laughs> physics, walk through wars or whatever it was and appear, you know, when the doors were locked and yet he was there in the midst of them. That body that ascended into heavens uh, and, and seated at the right hand of God, we will be like him when he is revealed. We know that. We have that tremendous confidence and assurance. We are a people who know. And that's what this man stood on. He said, look, you can argue about the Sabbath and whether Jesus sinner or not. I'll leave that to you. I'm going to tell you what I know. I know that once I was blind, but now I see. But unbelief, which is what they had, the rulers, is occupied with how. Questions like, well, how did this happen? How did he heal you? Tell us again. See, the, these are the, 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 the questions of unbelief. And, and you know when you, you're discussing with people about your own testimony, about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they come up with a question, you answer it. What do they do? They come up with another question. Why is that? They don't really want to know. They're not looking for reasons to believe. They're looking for excuses not to believe. And so they ask again, what did he do to you? I, I love this. I noticed you all laugh when, when I read this part. He asked, do you want to be his disciples too? In other words, I know why you're asking. You don't want to be his disciple. You're not asking so that you can learn and be a follower of Jesus. You're asking because you want to find something that you can use against him. Somebody said the mercy of God gave him his sight, but the wisdom of God taught him how to escape their trap. And Jesus promised us such wisdom when we are interrogated. He will give us the words to say. He will give us words of wisdom. We don't even have to think beforehand, he said, about what we're going to say. He'll put those words in our heart and in our mouths so that we can speak the wisdom of God. They said, we are disciples of Moses. We don't know where this fellow is from. Now, if you've been following through with me in John, which you have, most of you, you notice there's an inconsistency because in Chapter 7, he said, however, we know where this man is from. But now they're saying, we don't know where he's from. <laughs> and, and so there's an inconsistency. That's what happens in the end. When people are just looking for reasons not to believe, they say so much that actually they, they contradict what they've said previously. Let's go on. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he's from. Yet he has opened my eyes. What he's saying there is like, you, you, you're the guys that should be giving answers to this. Here's someone, this has never happened in the history of the world, that a man born blind uh, has his eyes open. In fact, in the Old Testament, there was not even one occurrence, if I'm not mistaken, of blind eyes being opened. And, and, and he's saying, you know, this is amazing. This has happened. You're the leaders, you're the spiritual leaders, and you can't give an explanation for this. You don't know where he's from, whether this is from God or what. The funny thing is this, that they said, um, he's a sinner, give glory to God. <laughs> so they're attributing it to a sinner, but then they're saying, give God the glory. So did God do it or did the sinner do it? You know, you, can you see what I'm saying? So this, this, this man is actually very sharp, even though he's been blind all his life, he's on the ball and he's got courage as well. He's standing up to them. Well, this is a marvellous thing, that you do not know where he's from, yet he's opened my eyes. Now, we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshipper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, 
he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins. And are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Amazing. This is amazing. They who profess to know so much about God cannot even say where this man who opened his eyes is from. Their unbelief is more of a miracle than the healing when you think about it. Jesus said this, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, nobody else had opened blind eyes, they would have had no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. In the age of the new covenant, this is why uh, this is such a remarkable thing. In the age of the new covenant, the restoration of sight to the blind is a sign that the Messiah has arrived. In Isaiah 35 and verse 5, in the context of the new covenant and when Messiah comes, we read, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. And again in chapter 42, verse 7, I will keep you, this is God speaking to his son, I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentile, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, etc., and so this is definitely a, a clear sign that the Messiah has come. Nobody else has done this, but when the Messiah comes, he will open the eyes of the blind. And that's what this blind man was saying. This man that was, was blind, but is now healed. He was saying, this is what the Bible says. This is what the scriptures say. And yet you can't acknowledge it. The amazing thing is this. You, you think about it. This man was born blind, so he never was able to read the scriptures all his life. I would imagine he was led to the synagogue every, every, every Sabbath. He, somebody probably helped him and he, he listened, he heard the word of God. And so he would have known these scriptures that I'm going to quote to you now. He would have known these truths. He was able to confront the, the religious leaders by, by saying, uh, you know, God doesn't, God doesn't listen to a sinner. If he is a sinner, you're saying he's a sinner. Why did God hear him and open my eyes? For example, in Psalm 66 and verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In, in the Proverbs uh, chapter 15 and verse 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Now, this sort of thing is over and over and over in the Old Testament. He would have gone along to the, the synagogue week by week and probably heard those things and at least known those truths. So he knew that what they were trying to put on him, that this man's a sinner, could not be true because God heard him and opened his eyes. Um, Charles Spurgeon said this, if Christ had been an imposter, it is not possible to conceive that God would have listened to his prayer and given him the power to open the blind man's eyes. So they treated this man terribly. They turned on the man in the end. They, they abused him. That's what the word reviled means. It means to use uh, speech to attack someone and to assault them, to abuse them. They insulted him. They said that the reason he was born blind, just like the disciples speculated, is because of his own sins. It was, it was his sins that caused his blindness. And they rejected him. This is the worst thing. They cast him out of the synagogue. Now last week I shared what that meant, just how serious a thing that was, because the whole of Judaism was built around the religion. So it, mean, it meant that he would not be allowed now to go to the synagogue. He would not be allowed even to be, uh, to, for people to associate with him. They would be in trouble if they were caught associating with him. And he would not be able to do any kind of business, buying or selling or trading because uh, he was excommunicated. Now, as I said last week, that would last for 30 days. If he recanted and, and sided with them, he would be forgiven and brought back in. But if not, he would give, be given another 30 days. And again, if he did not recant, then he would then be out forever. So this is a very big thing. They cast him out of the synagogue. When people turn from uh, their case, if they've got a case against you, but then all of a sudden, they start to attack you rather than try to state their case, you know they really don't have a case. We say they're playing the man, not the ball. You know, in sport, if, uh, if uh, 
maybe a side is losing or, or you know, an opponent is better, a better player. In the end, they don't play the ball, they play the man. They try to attack and, and injure the, the, the player and bring him down. That's what they were doing here. They had no case. They lost their case with this man. And so now they attack him and end up using their religious authority to excommunicate them. Um, maybe he had a birthday party as well, I don't know. <laughs> this is what religion does. But it's better to be cast out of a system that is to be spewed out of Christ's mouth than to remain in a system of which he is on the outside. Now, probably many, many of you will know what I'm referring to there in the book of Revelation. We see Jesus outside the church, the, the church at Laodicea, knocking on, 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 on the door. And, you know, he says to that church, you know, the hot or cold, I would spew you out of my mouth because they were content with church that seemed to be successful, but Jesus wasn't there. How tragic is that? To have even a full church, a packed church, and a vibrant church where, where it looks like there's a lot of activity and things are happening, but Jesus is not there. And, and so that's what this man experienced. He got cast out of a system where Jesus was supposed to be the chief cornerstone, but he was not allowed in. They wanted to get rid of him too. It's fitting that the next chapter, which we're going to start to look at next week, speaks of the good shepherd who comes looking for the sheep. Isn't that interesting? In contrast to thieves and robbers and hirelings. We'll look at that next week. But these were clearly not good shepherds. But Jesus is the good shepherd and he went to look for this man. We'll see that in just a moment. Like this man, when we believe Christ, we become a mystery to those who knew us before. And, we, and as we display increasing loyalty to him, so we will meet with more persecution. Okay, we'll look at that in just a moment. So Jesus comes looking for the excommunicated. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. The good shepherd found him. If he finds us, does it matter who rejects us? Amen. I know which side I'd rather be on, be with the shepherd. If anything has happened to grieve us, Jesus hears about it and comes to minister to us. Jesus heard about what they did to this man and he found him and he ministered to him. He asked him, do you believe in the Son of God? This is the crucial question. Charles Spurgeon said, with a saviour less than divine, you have a religion less than saving. Jesus is both man and God, fully man, fully God. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It, it needed God to come and save us. That's why he's the son of God. And all through this gospel, we've been seeing this theme that eternal life is simply given to those who believe in him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe that he is the son of God. Believe that he laid down his life for you and you will be saved. So he asked this man, do you believe in the Son of God? Who is he? It's the one who's speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. The more we know of Jesus and the dearer he is to us, the less we will care about those who reject us. You know, rejection is a problem to people who do not know fully their identity in Christ and their relationship with him. That surpasses all other things. How other, however uh, other people treat us is more than compensated by the way he accepts us unconditionally and loves us. Amen? Now I want you to see that we, how we grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. We see it in the life of this man. First of all, when he was healed, all he could say is, the man they called Jesus. The man they call Jesus. 
you know, what happened to you? Well, the man they called Jesus, he anointed my eyes, told me to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. I went and washed and I came sick. All I know is he was Jesus. And that's how it is in the beginning, isn't it? We heard that Jesus died for us and we put our trust in Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the next thing, they asked him, what do you think about him? And he said, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. He does bring the word of God to us. They said, you know, he was a counterfeit. He was an imposter. They said, no, he's, he said, no, I, he's a prophet. He's, he brings the word of God to us. Then the next thing they said is he's from God. He's from God. That was, that was the next declaration. He, he, he's, he's God who has come down to be with us. And then the next thing, he's the son of God. He's God manifest in the flesh. And then he's Lord. Lord, I believe. This man stood firm in the face of persecution and Jesus revealed more of himself to him. That's, that's how we grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. As we, as we put our trust in him, and sometimes we have to stand up for that in the face of persecution and opposition, Jesus promises that he will come and reveal more of himself to us. He who has my commandments and keeps them it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. That's powerful. That's powerful. The more we, we are faithful to Jesus, the more we, we receive a revelation. Now, you know, people are, are saying, and I've heard this a lot in the last two or three years, that something has happened in our world. It's, it's uh, turned a corner. It's become very dark and very scary uh, because of those in leadership and what we're, you know, what, what we're being told and taught and so on and what's being thrust upon us. It's getting darker and darker. But, but friends, I rejoice in that because there are promises that say when it gets darker and you stand firm in that darkness as the light of the world, you stand upright, you'll receive more light in your life. For example, the Bible says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And, and he says this, that darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness, the people, but the glory of the Lord shall be risen upon you. Can you believe that? I, I, I believe that that's something we're going to experience more and more. That as it gets darker out there, it's going to get brighter in here. In, in Christ, in, in, in the body of Christ, I mean. And, and, and that light is going to shine out more and more. There's going to be such a, an incredible uh, difference between light and darkness that will increase in intensity as we go. And Jesus promises this. If you keep his commands, if you stay true to him, he will come to you in those times and manifest himself to you. You'll see God working in you and through you and doing more and more miraculous things leading you to people that will come to Christ and, and sharing more in, in, in the, the supernatural work that he's doing in the earth. We will see that more and more as we stay faithful to him in these days. Amen? Amen. Okay, we finish up with these words. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have had no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore your sin remains. So let's just look at that as we finish up. We are blind or we see in proportion to our ability to see Christ's glory. If the Jewish leaders would only acknowledge their blindness, they could be healed. You know, Jesus said, I'm the doctor that's come for the sick. If you're not sick, I can't do anything for you. If you don't accept the fact that you need healing, I can do nothing for you. And so that's what he was saying here, the same thing. Now, the judgment that he's referring to here is not that which will be executed on the last day. He's not talking about that kind of judgment. When he says, for judgment, I've come into the world. What he's saying is this. I've come in to bear witness to the truth. And that word judgment actually means to choose. 
So when, when somebody hears the truth, they have to make a decision. They're either for it or against it. So it's a self-judgment. It's a judgment that comes upon ourselves. He says, for that judgment, I draw the line. And I ask people, which side of the line are you on? So I don't know what happened there. Which side of the line are you on? Which side of the line are you standing on? That's what he's referring to here. If we can have a look at this verse in, uh, we all know John 3, 16. The next verse says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He referred to a judgment concerning such a person, uh, sorry, concerning each person uh, as it becomes evident in, by their acceptance or their rejection of him. The following verse, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is what? Condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Jesus is saying, I'm not coming to the world to bring the judgment yet but to bring the salvation. But once you hear the gospel, there is a judgment that comes upon yourself. Either you're going to accept it or reject it. It's you that brings the judgment upon yourself. That's what he's saying. And that's what he was saying to those Jewish leaders. Whenever a person is confronted by Jesus, that person experiences judgment. Those who choose to respond to his teaching and claims come out of the darkness and into the light. Those who believe they do not need saving go deeper into darkness so just continuing on there in john chapter 3 this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they've been done in God. And, and, and uh, so Jesus is saying, okay, uh, are you, uh, can you see or are you blind? You decide. I've come and shared the gospel. If you say you don't need healing, you remain in your blindness. If you say we see, we've got it all sorted out, there's nothing I can do for you. We'll just close with this verse. When the gospel is preached, it is either a savour of life or of death. I don't know if you remember this verse that uh, Paul uh, wrote in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 15 and 16. He says, We are to God the fragrance of Christ amongst those who are being saved and amongst those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. Now, what he meant by that was this, he was using a custom that that world knew at that time. And it was this, when the Romans went out against uh, a people and conquered them, when they came back, they brought the captives with them, the kings or leaders or whatever, and people were there in the procession to welcome them back, the victory. And there, there was um, a sweet smelling aroma. There, were, there, were, it, there was incense burning. Okay, so that smell to those who were the victors was, was a savour of life, unto life, you see. It was like they were celebrating. We, this, this whole aroma speaks to us and reminds us of the victory that we have. But for those who were being led into their execution, it was a savour of death unto death. They knew what was coming. And that's how it is when we preach the gospel. It's either incredible good news that people want to embrace and believe and rejoice in because they know their sins are forgiven, they've been reconciled to God, they have a relationship with him, or it's the opposite. They hear news they don't want to hear. They, they've been reminded that you know, they have to decide either for Christ or against them. They can't remain neutral. And whatever their decision is, it's going to affect their eternity. And so that's what Jesus was saying here. But here was a man who once was blind and Jesus opened his eyes and he has a tremendous testimony. And regardless of what it cost him socially, he was able to stand up and say, I know what's happened to me. You can argue about whether this man is a sinner or not, you know, your, your Sabbath laws and all that sort of thing. But nothing can take away what has happened to me. And that's the testimony that we have, friends. And, and God will allow us, God will allow us opportunities to share that testimony 
even in this coming week. Let's believe that, that God will give us an opportunity and you'll just be reminded by the Holy Spirit that's what we were listening to on Sunday. Time to stand up and speak up for Jesus and just say, look, this is what's happened to me. I can't answer all your questions, but I know this has happened to me. It's changed my whole life, just like it changed that man's life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the good news of the gospel. We thank you that you so loved us that you sent Jesus into the world to die in our place, to be our saviour. And Lord, we do thank you that we are a people who know. We don't know all things, but we know what has happened to us. And we know it's something that can never be taken from us because you've given to us eternal life and we will never perish. We thank you for that, Lord. And we do pray that in these uh, dark days that we will be a bright, shining light that we'll share the good news, that we'll share our testimony, that we'll share the gospel, and that we'll have the joy of seeing those gospel seeds bearing good fruit uh, in, in, in the days to come. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.